can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power everybody. It's good to see you guys. Thanks for being here with us today. We're going we're gonna to kick off a, a new teaching series called Redefine, a good four-part series. Uh, but before we do that, uh, you know, this, pa- this past week on Wednesday, I came home from work and my, my youngest son comes barreling down the hallway with a big grin on his face and he says, Dad, we're going to get to do school from home again. And <laughs> And just this barrage of information he was, he was firing at me. And, 
I tried my best to mask the, the panic attack that I was having inside, you know? And um, I was pretty easy to surmise not, not too uh, long after that, that he was interpreting some of the things that he had heard at school. And uh, so I just asked him, like, hey, buddy, like, what did your teacher actually say to you? And it was, it was more about uh, preparing than it was actually going to happen. And uh, the funny thing was, it wasn't too long after that, uh, my wife comes home, she comes down the hallway, and I get to see him do the same thing to her, except I got to kind of snicker in the background knowing. And uh, that really launched uh, my wife and I into uh, a conversation that we've had uh, many times over the past couple years about these, these constant disruptions that, that happen in our lives and how those disruptions are beginning to really shift the way that we think and the way that we live in response to these disruptions. And, and this is going on, you know, around dinner tables all across the world. And the past two years, I, I think there's probably one word that, that probably sums up the past two years, and it's, it's this language of disruption. And we see this happening in our, in our families. You know, I had a chance to, to visit with my sister-in-law just yesterday. She's a school teacher up in the Casey area. And to hear, you know, what's going on with them and, and to know what's going on here in Columbia Public Schools. And I just can't imagine what it would be like to be in the educational system right now. Man, if you, if you are a teacher, you work in and around the school system, a pair of professionals around that, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. I just can't imagine waking up every day and not being quite sure how you were going to help other people grow in their education and knowledge. And it was like about a month ago, uh, my wife and I had a chance to have have dinner with an old family friend uh, from my side of the family, and she, she works as a consultant for uh, school districts in the KC metro area, and to hear the stories of what superintendents and principals and people who sit on school boards and ha- what they're having to go through, the barrage of disruptions and the voices from, from everybody just piling in on them, man, I, I, I got a, a whole new level of sensitivity to, to these levels of disruption. And this isn't just happening in the, in, the, in the education sector. And you don't have to scroll through your news feed to see this happening in, in the markets, in the economy, in the inflation. If you've been in the grocery store lately and you're like, that was super expensive. Uh, whether it's uh, supply chain or whether it's in the area of, of health care, and I, I was just in between services talking to uh, somebody who's a physician and works in the medical field and the, the constant disruption that they're having to face. I mean, this is happening, this is happening on every level of our life right now. And these, these constant disruptions, they're, they're shifting the way we think about things. It's shifting the way that we talk about things and the way that we respond in things. I, I like how one cultural commentator, pastor, theologian, he comes out of Melbourne, Australia, he says that what we're experiencing now are seismic shifts in our cultures and in our relationships with one another. And it's, man, it is really becoming something that if we're not careful, uh, we're going to lose sight of and lose grip on a lot of things. And you know, for a lot of people, when we start talking about the disruption and the shifts, maybe your mind goes to school or homeschooling, or maybe it goes to healthcare and all the different factors. Maybe you're watching your portfolio as the market is in constant flux. You know, there are some people who are just talking about the shifts of not being able to, to keep the lights on. Like my wife and I are sitting around a dinner table talking about what virtual learning looks like for our kids potentially in the future. But there are some people sitting around dinner tables saying, kids, I, I think the heat's going to get turned off. And that's a, re- that's a real issue that's happening um, right here in, in Columbia. You know, one of the things that we did um, over, the, over the Christmas season is we partnered with a local organization here called Love Columbia. And they're a Christian organization, non-for-profit organization here that's really on the front lines of what's going on with people in our community. And we, we, we love the work that Love Columbia does. It's one of the reasons why we wanted to partner with them. And because of your generosity, uh, we were able to help fund and support some of their programs. We were able to hand over a check of over $35,000 coming out of this Christmas season just because of your generosity. So here, a big heartfelt thanks uh, for, for showing your love in, in real tangible ways. It's making a difference here in this town. But we've also, we didn't just want to partner with them over the Christmas season. We, we actually invited them to come here, and they were on this stage just a few weeks ago, and we got to hear 
the different areas of ministry that they work in and how they help people. And we got to hear from their leadership team. And we had an opportunity then to, to sit and talk with them. And, and we met out in the lobby and, and we got to hear more about those specific programs. And it was, I mean, it was amazing to see how many people came out to hear about this organization, but to also be a part of, we called it our serving launch. And, and just dozens and dozens of people got plugged in to helping volunteer with Love Columbia. But here's one of the things um, that I wanted to, to push on just for a second is as we were just talking about what are some of the greatest needs that are happening in our community right now? And a lot of it centers around housing and the lack of affordable housing and the people that are now being evicted from their homes and the people who can't pay rent and they can't pay their bills for various reasons, mainly because of the disruptions and the shifts that are taking place in our culture. And that's just, they're not able to heat their homes and so this has really struck a nerve with the leadership team here at Forum, and we're actually launching today something we're calling uh, the Utility Assistance Program. And so this is for uh, the people who are, are here with us at Forum. If, if you are, for whatever reason, uh, struggling to keep the lights on or to keep the heat turned on, uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to text this number, 77411, text this short code, Utility Assistance Program, UAP22, and that's just going to get you into a pipeline. And for the next three months, uh, Forum is just going to try to walk with people through some of those difficult shifts that are happening. And we want to provide assistance. So it's for our, our sort of local congregation of Jesus followers and also the people that you know. So if you, this may not be hitting you, but it may be hitting somebody that you're close to or a family member or a friend or a relative or a neighbor. You can enroll them in this program. It would be a great opportunity to have a conversation with them about maybe some of the challenges they're going through. This is going to run for the next couple months. It's just a real tangible way we want to partner with people and step into some of these really dramatic shifts that have been happening as the cause of so many disruptions that have been going on in our world today. And I know if, if that's all we said, that can sound pretty like, oh, that's, that's, like, that's pretty dark, Brad. Like, come on, man. Um, I think actually something really good is actually happening in our world and our cultures and in our families and relationships because of these disruptions and these shifts. And that's primarily this. It's kind of like peeling back the surface layer and helping us to really get to some of the underlying issues that we have in our relationships, that we have in our communities, and we have in our world at large. And you could just look out over the landscape of the last two years, and you know what we have seen sort of a meteoric rise in over the past two years, this is going to sound really familiar, is in this, in this movement of activism. So this disruption and these shifts are pulling back the curtain to some of these, these real deeper issues that exist in our world today, some of the ones that have grabbed the headlines have to do with racism and injustice and social and economic inequality. And, and what does that look like? Now, listen, I'm not providing commentary, right or wrong. I'm not going to pick a side on these discussions. I'm just going to say, listen, this is bombarding our news cycles. And you can always tell what some of the underlying issues are in our culture. You just have to look into the realm of politics because politicians, typically, I'm not even, listen, I'm not providing commentary into politics either. It's it's, that's its own thing, but oftentimes politicians will weaponize one of these underlying issues, whether it's sexuality or gender or immigration or abortion rights or inequality or police funding. I mean, they will use this and they will just lob these sort of grenades over and against the other political party, but all that's really doing is it's helping us to see we've got some underlying issues going on in our world today, and if you're not, if you're not careful we'll start to buy into sort of the, the common rhetoric today is that in order to make a real lasting change in our community, all you need to do is, and fill in the blank, put a sign in your front yard, vote for this candidate, fund this, defund that. The list goes on and on as ways that we're gonna solve some of these underlying issues, but I think all of that really misses the point. And we can talk about the underlying issues that exist in our, in our world, in our communities, and in our own lives, but this is pretty low-hanging fruit. And we can look back over the annals of history and see, 
yeah, we, we don't do a super good job of truly addressing some of these underlying issues, and I'm going to pick on one that became really a hot-button issue, and I'm going to kind of push into that here for just a second, and, and the rise of activism in Black Lives Matter. So regardless of where you are on the spectrum of your understanding or belief or support or lack of support for that, just, just hear me out. There is a cry of a people saying, there's an injustice happening, and here's how we're going to solve it. But that doesn't really get to the core issue. The core issue is, is actually a sin issue. And so this is, this is what we're going to push into. This is like the doorstep of the series that we're in right now. Because as long as you and I look down on another person for any reason, whether it's the color of their skin, whether it's the place that they come from, the neighborhood they grew up in, the school that they went to, or the amount of money that they make or, or show us that they make, we will never truly solve some of these issues of inequality in our culture. You know what those are? Those are sin issues. Because the moment somebody starts to realize that we have been created in the image of God, the moment you can look at another human being, regardless of race, gender, belief, political ideology, stance on vaccines, the moment you can look at that other person as being created in the image of God is the moment we can actually start to bring healing into a wildly divided and factioned world. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend the next four weeks talking about maybe, what, maybe, maybe we need to redefine some of these things. Because it's one thing to sit in here on a Sunday morning and talk about we've got sin issues. Well, it's church on a Sunday morning. Maybe that's not a big shocker to any of you, right? But here's the deal. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push into the Christian community for just a second. We have, as Christians in the modern era, we have absolutely redefined sin. And I'm going to give you some examples here, and then we're going to, we're going to push into this, because I think ultimately what we need to do is redefine the redefined sin that's going on in the world. I know that's like a logical loop, so stay with me for just a second. To, to redefine something, this is just a, a dictionary definition, is the action or process of defining something again or differently. This is what we need to do with sin. For whatever reason... And I think there's a lot of reasons. And I, I'm, I'm really sort of picking apart my own life and my own heart. For, what, for whatever reason, this happens slowly and gradually over time. I can very easily start to redefine sin as something that's pretty harmless. As something that doesn't, I don't, I don't even necessarily need to talk about it or confront it or deal with it because it's not really hurting anybody. And I, I saw this attitude towards sin uh, really uh, took place, like gained a foothold in my life when I was a really young man and I was starting to date. And I was convinced that the inappropriate intimacy that I was experiencing with my girlfriends was totally harmless. I might have actually told you it was good. I, I guarantee you I would have told you that it was good because I enjoyed it. Now, that mentality that developed as a teenager, you know what, that idea that sin is, is harmless has been so pervasive in my life ever since because maybe it's not about sexual sin, but maybe it's about some of the language that I use when I talk about other people. Now, I'm going to make it super awkward, so just stay, stay with me for a second. One of the things that is often a sin of people who work in vocational ministry is we can often start to look at what's going on in other people's lives and we'll say things like this to ourselves or when we gather together with other pastors. We'll look at what's going on in our, in our congregation and we'll say things like, man, our people are just becoming so shallow. And you know, in the moment, I don't even think that I just sinned. But the moment that I start to use my mouth to break other people down is the moment I have, I've actually gone crossways with God. Now, am I willing to come up here and say that on stage with a microphone and spotlight? I totally am. And the reason why is because I'm so tired of it. But you know what we've seen a lot of over the last two years? Is that if somebody disagrees with us, I don't know, about anything, we feel justified in absolutely eviscerating them verbally, and that we don't have the courage or the guts to do it to their face. 
We'll make a spectacle of it with the people that we're close to. We feel like it's safe, that we can just, we can just absolutely rip people apart because of their stance on, I don't care, take your issue. There's a lot of them today, right? Vaccines, mandates, the CDC, take your pick. You don't agree with me? You know what I actually had somebody sitting around my kitchen table say to me, you know, people who vote for that person, I won't even talk to them. Like, hold on a second. When did that become okay? Well, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Well, I, I think we've redefined sin, and it's, maybe, that's, maybe that's not super good. Maybe the way that we talk about one another, maybe the way that we look one another is super critical and we're losing sight of it with inside of the Christian community. I'm going to push into another one here really quickly. We also have redefined sin as something that is okay to hide. And I think we all know, we all know why we hide our sin. Number one, we don't label it as sin anymore. Maybe it's something that's harmless. Maybe it's not that big of a deal and then we say, well, maybe, you know, that, that's not sitting real well with me. So I'm just going to hide that from everybody. And this has become so dangerous in our Christian communities that have absolutely taken the language of confession out of our lives. And we want to just, we just want to maybe, maybe like talk to God about the sin in our life and ask for his forgiveness. But we never go to the person that we actually sinned against and confess that sin even though you and I, I know many of us, if you're a follower of Jesus today, chances are you would say that the scriptures, that God's word is like, is like everything to you, that you believe it's inspired, it should shape your life. But when it comes to living out what the scripture calls us to do, suddenly things get a little fuzzy. So when we're commanded to confess our sins one to another, you know what we do? We just don't do that. We keep it internal and we hide it. And here's where I'm super sensitive to this because this, this is what I do with my sin. I'm so ashamed by it. I feel so guilty for it. I would rather have 10 sleepless nights than go to the person that I sinned against and ask for their forgiveness. Okay, that, that is a deep underlying issue that is getting brought to the surface in the midst of the disruptions and the shifts that are happening in our relationships, around our kitchen tables, in our communities, and in the world at large. And I'm just like, guys, maybe it's time we start dealing with it. If we want to see real change happening, it's one of my favorite phrases, phrases, revival always starts with us. You want to see change? Don't look to Washington. Look to your own life. Look to the creator of the world to promote and create that change. I'm just saying, man, we're going to have a hard time living out the realities of the gospel if we're not willing to confront the sin in our life. So I'm going to push into one more. We have, for whatever reason, come to believe, and I think redefine sin, not only as harmless, not only as something to hide, but we've actually started to label it as something that's good. Like we, we, we actually will defend, I have heard this not just in modern Christianity, in this church, we will wear like a badge of honor. Oh, I just told them and I just told them off. And we, we use this language like confronting somebody with their difference in opinion and ideas and to somehow beat them down is actually good. We, we somehow we've convinced ourselves that sinning is, is good. And it most often exists in our language and in the way that we treat one another. And we may not say to somebody that we stand in total opposition to them. We will just cut them out of our life. We will ignore them. We will punish them through silence and then we'll brag about it to other people guys that that's not good that's what destroys relationships that's not good in any kind of way that, that's one area i'm gonna push into one other really quick and then we're gonna get in some of these passages 
We're seeing this happen in, in a super alarming rate. And if, you, if you've never heard some of this language, I'll try to explain it in, in the most concise fashion as I can. It's, um, uh, there are, there's a movement, I would say one of the largest movements that's happening with inside of modern Christianity is known as the progressive movement. And churches are labeling themselves as progressive churches or historic churches. And here's, what, here's some of the, the key tenets of a progressive church would be to remove the inspiration of the scripture. I was literally reading this on a church website that this is merely the construction of humans. And the moment you do that, you take the deity of Jesus and the words of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus and discipleship of Jesus and you remove it from Christianity and you call that good. They are calling this, I'm hearing this heralded from the bastions of this progressive movement. Oh, this is what God is doing. God is helping to evolve Christianity so that it can be inclusive of literally everything. And we'll call that good. Oh, it's being called good. It's being called great. And it's, and it's taking over seminaries and Bible colleges across this country. My friends, we, it is happening right around us right now. And just in case you're wondering, we are not a progressive church. I, I have no problem hanging on to that historic label that looks at the word of God as the inspired and revealed word of God that primarily points to his son Jesus. Man, we stand firm on that. There's just certain things we're never going to negotiate. That's totally one of them. And yes, there, there is this weird thing happening where, where that, like that idea is now being challenged. Okay, we're watching this seismic shift in our culture. And I'm, I'm saying, my friends, we, it's time that we do something about it. And so let's start connecting some of these dots. So Brad, what you're saying is there's lots of disruptions, yep, from supply chains to academics to economics to the church that are causing these huge seismic shifts, and you're saying the way to start dealing with it is to deal with our own sin? That's totally what I'm saying. That is the foundation of this entire series where we're going to spend the first two messages redefining sin according to the scriptures and we're going to spend the last two messages redefining what it means to follow Jesus because that one idea is absolutely being hijacked by this progressive movement. Now following Jesus is becoming something super, it, it doesn't involve anything that Jesus said. Super dangerous and it's taken over. So Here's what we're going to do. Today we're just going to look at the Old Testament. Just for the next seven, wow, 17 minutes, we're going we're gonna to somehow summarize how the Old Testament talks about sin. And you're thinking, well, this, this, the Old Testament's quite big, Brad. How are you going to do that? Well, here's the really cool thing. Uh, sin is talked about in the Old Testament in, in th there's a few more, but three primary ways. And we can sort of go into three primary passages and really see a really robust understanding of how the Old Testament defines sin. And so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to start now. Pop quiz, last service, nailed this. Where do you think sin is first mentioned in the Bible? Genesis, nice, good job, super thankful. So the first book of the Bible is where we start learning about sin. Is that, that should give us some intimation. And we're going to learn a lot about the first time that sin is mentioned. Now, for many of us, if you've ever grown up in church and maybe you think, yeah, the first time sin is mentioned is in the story of Adam and Eve, that's Genesis chapter 3, that's actually not where the word sin is used for the first time, but it's the first place we see the expression of sin come out. And ultimately, Adam and Eve, they were, they were tempted to doubt the truth of God, and they were tempted to believe that if they acted in rebellion, that they would actually become like God, that they could for themselves define right and wrong, they could sit in that place of ultimate definition. So we shouldn't be surprised at all, really, the sort of the series is kind of built off some of these big ideas that we have been trying to redefine what God has said since the very beginning. So come with me to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 is the story of Adam and Eve's kids. So mom and dad reached out 
and wanted to grab authority for themselves to become like God, to be the ones who get to decide the difference between right and wrong, to redefine things on their own terms. Do you think that turned out super well? Oh, man. Genesis chapter 4. We're just going to be looking for the first time sin is mentioned, and we're just going to be looking. How does the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, define sin? When these boys grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain, his brother, cultivated the ground. You've got a, somebody who deals with the livestock, and you've got a farmer. You've got somebody who's cultivating the ground. And then it was time for the harvest. Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Cain, here, here's what I love, some of the rabbinical literature would talk about how Cain was an innovator of worship. That God didn't command him to make a sacrifice. There was no sacrificial system. There was no priesthood. There was this, the early origins of humanity, and yet somebody was experiencing the blessings that were coming from God, and something stirred deep within them and said, I want to give back to God a portion of what he's given me. We're, we're still doing that today. The reason why we were able to give $35,000 to Love Columbia is because you are giving back to God a portion of what he's blessed you with. One of the reasons why Forum has been able to withstand all the disruption and the shifts in our culture is because you have constantly been giving back to God a portion of what he's given to you and your time and your energy and your resources. That, my friends, is beautiful. And so you know how brothers are. Abel sees what, what bro did. Well, I'm bringing a gift too, man. And so he brings, listen to this, he brings the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. He's bringing a kind of sacrifice. Now, the text doesn't give us a ton of detail other than to mention that Cain brought a gift and Abel brought the best of what he had. Imagine Abel is just coming at it from a little bit different angle. And, and this made a big difference to God. So he looks at what Abel brought and he was like, this, this is a delight. This gets to that heart level. So when you hear about God's acceptance of something, you're hearing the scriptures talk about what brings delight to the heart of God. But there was something about Cain's offering. It, it wasn't quite right. And God doesn't just launch out in judgment against Cain, but watch Cain's response to God's lack of acceptance, it made him so angry, like rage angry. It was affecting his whole life. It's like defecting his demeanor. You could see his anger. And so God steps right into that. Why are you so angry? Why, why are you letting this affect you so deeply, Cain? You, you will be accepted. You can be the delight of my heart if you do what's right. This is, this is like an echo of the Genesis narrative in chapter 3. If you stay connected to me, Cain, don't wander from this path. If you do what's right, but if you go the way of your mom and dad, you know what's going to happen. And he issues this warning. God also issued a warning to Adam and Eve guys, don't go over here. Don't do that. That's going to bring in death. It's going to bring in destruction. They didn't heed the warning of God just like Cain does it. Now watch the first time sin is mentioned. Watch out, Cain, because sin is crouching at the door eager to control you. The first time sin is mentioned in the Bible, it's personified as a beast waiting lurking in the shadows. His ultimate desire is to control you. And I, I, like, I like what God says right after that. But that doesn't have to be your fate, Cain. You, you can subdue it. It doesn't have to rule over you. I would encourage you to finish out the Cain and Abel narrative at some point later today or throughout this week. I'm, I'm going to give you a little preview of what it says. Cain chose the way of death. He lures his brother out into a field and he executes him. We see the entrance of death in the Garden of Eden and its expression in just the next generation. 
How do you think the Bible talks about sin from this moment on? It talks about sin killing, dividing, and devouring people, families, cities, and nations over and over and over again. So hear me what I'm saying. You could look into Genesis chapter 4 and see one of the primary ways the Hebrew scriptures talk about sin. It, it isn't something that's harmless. It isn't something to flirt with. We need to scratch out that definition and redefine it according to what God's word says. Sin is deadly. Now here's, here's, here's the thing. The moment we are confronted with this, you and I are given a choice. We can either choose to turn a blind eye to the deadly nature of sin, or we can, like many people who have come before us, be honest and confront that sin and say, okay, hold on a second. So you're saying, when I come out against people who don't think like me, that's deadly? Yep. Can't you see it? Can't you see how deadly it is? It's easy to talk about some of our underlying issues. We'll, we'll hear articles and news pundits talking about how divided we are as a people. The, what's the real issue? Well, we've got sin issues that constantly want to define what's right and wrong. And if you don't agree with me, you're not God. I am, so I get to do whatever I want. Is, is that super helpful? Why? Why are we so divided? Why are our families disintegrating? Why in the midst of such global disruption and seismic shifts in our cultures and our families are we not thriving and yet we're, we're not even willing to look at the real issue? So I'm going to turn all this around in just a, a simple question. I, I hope this will sort of guide our, our time together and also our prayer life and hopefully in the weeks and months and years to come. It's a difficult diagnostic question and just ask, how am I defining the sin in my life right now? For those of you who claim to be Jesus followers, I, I think most of us would probably and probably heard to some extent this, this, this phrase or these ideas that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And many of us who read the scriptures and believe that they're inspired word of God, we may know those passages, but do we live today like we have sin in our life that is absolutely deadly? Or are you like me and you want to minimize your sin so that it just kind of seems harmless? Maybe what we need to do is redefine sin according to what the scriptures say. And so what we're going to do next is we're going to go into another big idea that is prevalent throughout the scriptures. Now if you could imagine out of God's unfailing love and his compassion towards us. He, it's like he, he always wants us to know that sin is what separates us from him, but he will be relentless in his pursuit of us in spite of that separation. Now, you go a couple, a couple books in the, in the Old Testament, a little bit further out of Genesis, and you get into what's known as the, the book of Leviticus. And <laughs> Leviticus gets a bad rap. I've often heard people say, I might have said at some point in my life that if you have trouble sleeping, start reading the book of Leviticus. I don't say that anymore. I don't advocate that at all because the Leviticus is like the holy code. It's basically the heart of God on display saying, as a sinful people, here's, what, here's what's required in order to bring you as close as possible to me. It's where the priesthood emerges. It's where the sacrificial system emerges, all within this idea of God wanting to be as close as possible to this. Now, that reading may not be easy, but it is absolutely, it is majestic in its design and in its purpose. Now, the centerpiece of the, of the holiness or the Levitical system is actually one day, and it was a day of celebration. But not the celebrating like you and I think. It was a day to celebrate God's faithfulness and his forgiveness and our response. It's called, it's called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It was a day, it was a national holiday where people would repent of their sins and confess them, not just privately, but publicly 
Imagine that, an entire nation repenting and confessing their sin and making a sacrifice to God. God designed this system to bring us as close as possible to him and on the highest holy day in Israel's calendar celebrated every year even to this day by those Greek Orthodox Jews and others. We see something so powerful. I'm going to go into the book of Leviticus in chapter 16. And, we, and I just want to like pierce in. There's, there's a lot inside of this, but two big ideas. One is repentance and the other is sacrifice. With inside of the idea of sacrifice is the language of purity. That's where we're going to step into this text. Leviticus chapter 16, starting in verse 20. When the high priest, his name was Aaron at that time, when he finished purifying the most holy place, this was the only day out of the entire year that the high priest, he was the only one, he could go into the most inner section of the temple known as the Holy of Holies, and he went in there to sprinkle blood as a way to purify, as a way to draw humanity close to God on this holiest of days. And then do you know what he did? He had to present this live animal, this live goat, where he would lay both of his hands on the goat's head and he would audibly confess over this animal all the wickedness, the rebellion, the sins of the people. And it was in this way that there was like this transfer that took place. It was kind of like a, a rollover. And all the sins people would be transferred to the head of this goat. Then this guy was specifically chosen for the task of driving the goat out into the wilderness. And as this goat goes into the wilderness, it it metaphorically, symbolically carries all the people's sins upon itself into a desolate land because sin had to be confronted and it had to be dealt with. But until the time of the Messiah, there was going to be no way to purify the people from their sins. So they had this goat of escape, often called the scapegoat. And it was sent out in front of a nation of people. This is what God is going to have to do with our sins. The only modern equivalent I could ever come up with, if you can think of a better analogy, please help me. This is going to date me a little bit. Anybody 40 and above will get this. Do you guys remember when you had to buy minutes for your cell phones? You know what I'm saying? It's like I got, three, I got the 300 minute plan. It's $700 a month. <laughs> you know? And then, and then, I'll never forget Singular. Doesn't even exist anymore. AT&T bought them out. Singular rolled out the rollover plan. You know what you could do? If you only use 250 of those 300 minutes, you got to roll over 50 into the next month. Yes. Right? That's the world we lived in. It's madness. <laughs> this is the only equivalent I could think of to think of like that. That's basically what was happening with their sins. They were just being rolled over year after year. The sacrificial system itself, the day of atonement was all pointing to Jesus who is going to be the only one who could actually provide true atonement and purification and forgiveness of sins. I mean, that, Leviticus, points to Jesus. That's, that, is, that is brilliant. And so we could just say really quickly, do you know, th this is like the language of every prophet in the Old Testament, calling people to confront the sin in their life. Don't hide it. Let's be honest about it. Sin isn't something that we need to hide. I, need, I think we need to scratch that out. We're going to learn a lot from the Old Testament that we need to confront the sin that we have in our life. We have got to get to a point of reclaiming the spiritual practice of confession. For most of us today, confession exists in a silent conversation between God and us. This is not how the writers and the people who lived in, in, the, in the time of the scripture understood confession. They understood confession to be partly between you and God, but the other part was between you and your community and against the people you have sinned against. This has been absolutely removed from our Christian communities. I mean, just think really quickly. When was the last time you confessed your sin to anybody ever. This is where my brothers in the, in the Catholic faith tradition, man, they, they start to dial into that in a way that I think can be helpful. 
that's a separate discussion. Can, can be helpful. It can be helpful. That is another thing. This is something, my friends, we, we have an opportunity to do t- today. And I know for many of us, one of the reasons why we hide our sin is because of the consequences of what's going to happen when it comes into the light. But we also would be, at the same time, we want to hide our our shame and our guilt, and we don't want to confront the issues. But at the same time, we're more depressed and more anxious with the highest suicide rate than ever before in human history, and we're not connecting the dots. We want to talk about underlying issues without actually addressing the sin issues in our life. Have you ever considered Maybe that burden that you feel that's keeping you up late at night is because you have yet to bring your sin into the light. I'm not saying it's not going to be hard. But I am saying this is the way that God is calling us to. And so I want to bring all this down. This is is such a, a seminal idea in the Old Testament. To just go into this one passage in Leviticus 16 can unlock almost all the language of the prophets. You know what the prophets said to the nation? Confess your sins and repent and turn to God. I would literally just summarized every prophetic book in the Old Testament. Turn to God. Why do we think it's any different for us? So let's just, let's just make this super practical and go, how am I defining the sin in my life right now? What does it look like? Have I given in to some weird redefinition that I didn't even know was happening that I need to just hide my sin? Here's what I've been convinced of because this is what I see in my own life. Sometimes I have been hiding my sin for so long, I don't even see it anymore. And so if you get into this moment, it's like, wait a minute, if I'm supposed to confront my sin, what, what sins do I have? Okay, that's a symptom of a very serious issue. Because on one hand, we'd say, yeah, we all have sin, and we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but I... I guess I don't have any. You may just be so far down the road that your own sin is even hidden from you. That is the ultimate deception. I absolutely am convinced that is where our adversary is at work in our lives today in our Christian communities. Because if you can hide sin, even within your own heart, how will you ever confess it? It's gonna, this is actually kind of the the fire that's burning hopefully within inside of our hearts. It's gonna fuel our prayer. So third and final big idea about sin through these sort of three lenses, we can see really how sin is talked about in the entirety of the Old Testament. And to do that, I want to go into Psalm 51. I would really encourage everybody to go to Psalm 51 with me because this text is is remarkable. And it's going to be a passage I'm going to encourage people to come back to over and over again, especially as you and I navigate the complexity of confronting our own sin and redefining it as deadly we're going to start to feel the weight of it. You're going, to, you're going to experience the ramifications of confessing that sin, and it's going to be hard. Psalm 51 can be a kind of medicine for the soul. Now, I want you to look uh, just before verse 1. There's, in most of your Bibles, like mine here, the NLT, it says this as like a, pre- a preface to verse 1. For the choir director, a psalm of David, regarding the time Nathan the prophet came to him, after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. This puts Psalm 51 chronologically in the life of King David, who had executed the husband of Bathsheba in order to take her for himself. And you have to remember, in the time of King David, kings could do anything they wanted to anyone at any time, and it was expected. And for a prophet to come to a king, now, now imagine this, to even approach a king, to come into the royal courts, put your life at risk, it didn't matter what you were talking about. Because if the king disagreed with you, or he even perceived you had some form of malice or anger or accusation against you, he could execute you on the spot, no questions asked. Next, please. In that time period, the prophet Nathan goes and confronts David with his sin and watch how David responds. We are going to get a picture of what God longs for in our response to the sin in our life. Watch this. He says, have mercy on me, O God. 
Have mercy on me because of who you are, a God of unfailing love. I love this verse because David is appealing to God on the basis of God's character, not David's sin. Now this, my friends, is such an encouragement to me because I think I don't deserve his forgiveness. But to think of his relentless, unfailing love in the midst of my sin it, it brings healing. And I like, I like David's like, I know who God is and I should appeal. I must, God, I'm just going to remind you that your love never stops. Remember that? <laughs> and he says, because of your great compassion, will you blot out the stain of my sin? Now, we are reading the song. I think this is like a, a journal entry in, in, in David's life where he's broken over his own sin, and he says, because of your unfailing love and because of your compassion, God, I need you to deal with my sin. I'm gonna confront it, God, but I I don't have forgiveness in and of myself. I need you. Watch this. Wash me clean from my guilt. How many of us right now are buried underneath guilt and ultimately, deep within inside of us, maybe at the heart of your addiction, maybe one of the reasons why you cannot keep scrolling is because you are longing for validation. You want to feel better, even if in just for a moment you need that dopamine hit to relieve the guilt and the shame that you're feeling. This is God's invitation saying, oh, uh, I will cleanse you from that. You don't have to pick up that bottle. You don't have to take those pills. You don't have to put that in your body to numb you temporarily from this pain. There is something that can absolutely bring your dead, sinful soul back to life. I think, you know, we want to talk about the underlying issues. We want to talk about opioid epidemics and the rise of addiction in the midst of these disruptions and shifts. But you know what we're not talking about? We're trying to fill a God-sized hole with everything else in life, and we know it doesn't work, but we keep trying. Psalm 51 is the way out. He says, purify me from my sin. I recognize my rebellion, and it haunts me day and night. Now, while on one hand there will be people here this morning who are underneath the weight of their sin, there are some of us here today who are like, I haven't had a sleepless night over my sin ever. Maybe maybe it's time to redefine sin according to the scriptures. And maybe that isn't even going to bring the weight of condemnation and guilt. Maybe when we begin to redefine sin according to the scriptures, it's actually going to provide the only true relief we've been longing for. He says, against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done. Listen to this. What is evil in your sight? Listen to this phrase. You will be proved right in what you say in your judgment against me is just. It's like David saying, whatever you say is good because you are just and righteous. And I, I am a sinner. Now that is the heart that God longs for. I could trace this all the way back to the sacrifice being made. This is what he's looking for. In just a minute, we are going to have an opportunity to make a sacrifice of praise. It's like I just want to encourage people just to sing or to pray or to come into the Sunday gatherings just because they want to go through the motions. Let it be something that stems from your heart coming into the presence of a community of Jesus followers who long to be connected to God who recognize we've been separated him because of our sin, we've been separated from each other because of our sin, and we are longing for a different way that only comes through Jesus. Sin has been redefined by many of us and by many in the Christian culture as something that's good. I think we need to scratch that out and say, no, sin, sin, sin's evil. It's God who is good. And, and the moment we label sin as deadly as something that we need to confront and as evil is the moment we will come face to face with two things, really. Our own stain, our own evil, 
and the glory of the gospel. Because the moment the weight of your sin becomes unbearable is the moment you cry out to a loyal, compassionate God who offers you forgiveness. The enemy wants to, wants to trick all of us into thinking that sin is going to bury you. He's only half right. Sin should bury all of us. And it'll be Jesus who brings us back to new life. Is it any wonder why Jesus say, if you wanna, he says, if you want to follow me, you have to come and first die. And I will bring you back to life. It's the only way it works. He is the only remedy for the sin issue in our life, in our world, and in our city. Now, you want to make a difference in your city? You want to make a difference in your home? You want to make a difference in the world? It actually starts with redefining the sin in our life. And I know some of those connections may seem a little abstract and a little obtuse, but stay with me here for just a second because what would happen in your home if you confronted the sin that you're dealing with right now and the glory and the light of the gospel broke out and people got to see firsthand how a sinner is saved by grace. You think that's going to make a difference in your marriage? You think that's going to make a difference with your kids? Absolutely. You want to make real lasting difference? I'm just borrowing language from social psychologists and behavior analysis and and people who work in the realm of psychology that say, actually, the greatest force for change starts in our homes. And my brothers and sisters, this is the invitation we have today. This this can be today. And I I know, here's what's going to happen for many of us as we begin to push into our sin, ask God to reveal our sin, as we begin to confess, I can guarantee you this. All of hell is going to come out against you. And it's not going to be obvious, and it's going to be super subtle, and it's going to be in redefining what it is that God really said. Our adversary is just up to his old tricks in redefining the truth in a way that's a total perversion, but it looks really good. So let's think about all this. Just, just we'll put all this together here really quickly. We've had a lot of disruption that's caused a lot of shifts, that's peeled the, peeled the veneer, pulled back the curtain on some underlying issues that we've been mislabeling. They're really sin issues. And the moment we start to redefine those sin issues according to what God says, the moment the cross and the empty tomb come center stage. And the moment we stand in the shadow of the cross and the light of the empty tomb is the moment our life will begin to change. And with that, let's pray. And let's use all of this as like kindling as fire. And let's, let's in just the next few minutes, let's just flood heaven with our prayers. Would you join me? Our God and our Father, we approach you in our unworthiness. We are in full recognition that our sin has separated us from you. And we now, as a community, we confess those sins before you. We want to use your terms. That these sins, they're deadly. And they're evil. We don't want to hide from them anymore. We want to confront them, but we want to do that in a way that that shines light on your love for us. That though while we are still sinners, you sent your son in the midst of all of our wickedness, that is beautiful. And so on one hand, our prayer is one of repentance and confession. On the other hand, it is just pure gratitude for the way you love us, for your, for your compassion. May we spend the rest of our life praising you for your goodness and for your forgiveness. So we're asking for a right view of our sin and a bigger view of your son. 
And I pray, may you, by your spirit and through your word in this community, flood our hearts with the light of the gospel. Let it transform us. Give us the courage to come and die and give us faith and belief that in you there is true resurrected life. So, our Father, we're going we're gonna to put ourselves in some really awkward situations and say hard things and we're asking for your grace and compassion as we do it. And ultimately, we stand before you now humbled by your word humbled by your love crying out God we need you and so may the words of this song that we're going to sing may they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight not because we're good enough but because your son is worthy of all of our praise and we pray this now under the banner of his name the name that is above all names the name of Jesus amen I invite you to stand. Um, let's stand together. You know, David had the correct response to his sin. He had the right perspective. He had the right definition of what sin was. And I would like us to just unite our voices on that scripture from Psalm 51. Let's read this together out loud. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Then I will joyfully sing your forgiveness. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God.
cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Cause Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. together. You know, God's word reminds us in Romans 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death. But the good news, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And in this moment that we're going to share together right now, we hold in our hands that sacrifice that Jesus gave to us. And we remember it's a free gift of grace. And the very thing that David longed for and hoped for in that psalm, we get to realize in this moment, our sins are forgiven. We are washed clean because of Jesus' sacrifice. So in this moment, let's confess, let's repent, and let's trust in our Savior, Lord Jesus. Let's have communion together right now. continue to focus our worship on Jesus.
with whatever battle you may be facing, know that Jesus has already overcome. So let's declare these words together with one voice. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the his praises over every area of our life. Guys, it was wonderful to worship with you. And if there's anything that you have on your heart that you would like prayer for, we would love to pray for you. And the easiest way to submit a prayer request is by going to our website at forumchristian.org. And if you're new with us, we'd love to invite you to our Connect event this Tuesday evening from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, this is just a great opportunity for you to meet some of our staff, ask questions and learn more about our ministries. Um, dinner and childcare are provided and today is the last day to sign up so make sure you do so at the kiosk or on lifeforum.me. We hope you all have a great week and we look forward to seeing you soon.